from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and today I'm joined once again by the one, the only, Buzzy Cohen. Welcome back. Thank you, Sarah. I am here to fill the seat and the space of Michael Peterson Davies and it is an honor and it helps that when you live just just a bike ride away and you guys need someone for the podcast i'm here if here you to could do only it. see buzzy's arrival it is it <laughs> is full electric bike excellence <laughs> well lots of great response i think to having you on the podcast but also to our tournament of champions announcement last week people very happy to see all the four-time champions in there yeah i i think that they are responding to what we are all excited about with this tournament which is you get to see even more great champs, and it's uh, it's a new, exciting way to to relive their runs and see how good these people are in that upper echelon of play. Yeah, and with this new format, the chance you know to have as many as seven games in the finals, depending on how long it takes a single player to get to three wins, overall consensus seems to be, and we here at Jeopardy agree that the more opportunities to see these fantastic champions, the better. I will say, along with all the fanfare and the support, we received a few valid questions. And as your exclusive place for all things Jeopardy, we want to address those right here, right now on the podcast. First up, many of you, you know, you got out your calendars. You saw that the TOC was debuting on Monday, October 31st, and that there may be no way to avoid an interruption to the tournament because of Election Day on November 8th. Well, don't you worry. We're going to assure everyone that you will not miss a minute of the competition. We're going to conclude the quarterfinals on Monday, November 7th, and then we're going to feature special programming on November 8th. Then on the 9th, you'll have the first of our three semifinal games going forward. Love special programming. Yeah. Yeah, very mysterious. You've caught my attention. We like to keep a little bit of mystique, but we just want to make sure that no (laughs) one in any of our local markets is concerned that they're going to get a preemption. That's hard on a tournament like, you know, it's one thing on a a regular day that happens with sporting events, elections, but for a tournament like this, you really want to see every minute. Yes. So you will see every minute. A second concern we heard about was the TV listings. People are nervous that they're going to spoil the outcome of the finals. Don't worry. We have Mm. a plan. No matter when it ends, whether it's game three, four, five, six, or seven, it will say on your listings, game four if necessary, and so on and so forth. So don't worry. We've got a plan for that, and we're not going to let you know the outcome. Spoiler-free zone, inside Jeopardy, and beyond. I love it. And finally, people have also written us asking for a plan for the regular shows that are going to air after the Tournament of Champions concludes. Well, the answer is... We're going to roll right back into regular programming and pick up where our returning champion left off on whatever day of the week that happens to be. So we felt shifting the traditional Monday through Friday schedule was worth it in this tournament for a chance to have a seven day final. So we could see our champion come in on a Thursday if the finals go five games, come back on a Friday if it goes six. You know, it just depends on when it concludes, but our returning champion will come back at that time and we'll just get back into I can I can tell you it's only it's only been a few weeks into season thirty nine, but it's already off to a fantastic start. Yeah, I mean you would think that oh after the tournament there's gonna be this letdown, but that is not the way that Jeopardy has been rolling lately and I think it's just gonna help us skyrocket to the next level of uh season 39. Yeah, interestingly enough, Amy Schneider was well in her great, fantastic run when we took a break for the Professor's Tournament. So we'll see. Could be something similar in season Mm. 39. Speaking of teases, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Well, one of the reasons we're very excited about having this podcast, we've been promising you that we're going to take you inside the show. We're going to share interviews with Jeopardy! champions, celebrity fans, members of our community, and most importantly, people from our Jeopardy! team. And coming up today... Buzzy and I will be speaking with our co-head writers, Billy Weiss and Michelle Loud. I cannot wait to have that conversation with them. They are superstars in my world and I think in many Jeopardy! champions and fans' world. But first, let's get into some game recap from this last week's episodes. All right, our road to the TOC continues as we are featuring some of our best episodes from season 38. We start off on Monday's show, Amy Schneider going up against our second chancer, Pam Schoenberg. 
This was a game. Yeah, this was a great example where Amy was really up against the wall at the end of the Jeopardy round, and she just turned it on. And I think Michael spoke about that last week. Amy is so good at getting refocused and not falling into the trap of, oh, I'm behind, I can't make it up. And you watch that double Jeopardy round, and it is like everyone's standing still. Yeah, we ended the Jeopardy round. Pam had a huge lead, and then bam, before you knew it, Amy. But still Pam in contention going into final. Oh, yeah. And I have to say my favorite moment, Johnny Gilbert doing the action movie lines. I mean, to hear Johnny Gilbert say, I'll be back, <laughs> nothing like it. <laughs> I'm always up for a comedy Johnny Gilbert category. I think there should be more. I, I mean, who can forget Johnny Gilbert with rap lyrics? I think oh, a I classic. Think, you know, maybe we maybe we feed some fandoms, do a Johnny Gilbert Taylor Swift category or a Johnny Gilbert Harry Styles category. We'll talk maybe we should talk to Billy. Maybe and you Michelle know you might have an inside track with the co head writers coming up here. So yeah. I don't know. I'll pitch it. Get that in. Next up we headed into Tuesday's match. This was a semifinal game from our professors tournament. Sam Buttry, JP Allen, Katie Reed any chance to see our Steve Martin look alike. And he played so well. Really strong game. And of course, getting Final Jeopardy right, that was a tough Final Jeopardy as evidenced by the other two contestants not getting it, the other two professors not getting it. And I have to say the thing I really learned is that there is a postgraduate naval school. I had no idea. Sam. Sam knows a lot about it. Sam knows a lot about it. And he taught us a lot about it. I have to say my (laughs) favorite thing from that game Say something, silly professor. Any mm. chance within a Jeopardy game that you have Caddy Wampus, Malarkey, and Zizzy Baluba? It's a good show. Great show. All right, moving into Wednesday's game where Amy Schneider came up against a strong opponent in Doe Park, who will be back for second chance. Doe played really well, and it was so close that if Amy had gotten final Jeopardy incorrect and Doe had responded correctly, he would have dethroned Amy. Yeah, this is one of the closer games in Amy's run. Certainly one of the reasons we're welcoming Doe back for second chance. And you got to hear Christmas songs. (laughs) You got to hear (laughs) Grandma got run over by a reindeer. And Amy did run that category, as Ken pointed out. Yeah, she played great in that game. Next up, we have Thursday, another great Amy Schneider competition. This time, not as close, but it was a special game because she was honoring Julia Collins, one of her favorite players. She wore a sweater. It was her 20th appearance, and she wanted to pay tribute to one of her favorite players by wearing a sweater, kind of an iconic Julia Collins moment, our 20-game champion. Yeah, I think Julia Collins is many people's favorite player, and I think that was a big moment for Jeopardy and for all of us when Amy hit that moment. And, of course, very, very gracious of her to, to honor Julia. Who were, I mean, who doesn't love Julia Collins? I can't, I can't think of a single person. She's <laughs> on our leaderboard of legends. We certainly love her. And I'm, certainly our leaderboard of sweater sets. Also that. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting thing in this game, it was, I want to, I did say it was a big win for Amy, but I want to point out that it was a perfect round in the Jeopardy round. Yeah. 30 correct responses. So that says a lot about the the, quality of the quality of the contestants. Absolutely. Moving on to Friday. This is where Amy stood alone in fourth place for most consecutive games won. We also learned that Amy got a perfect 1600 on her SATs in that game. Oh, my God. Is there anything that Amy isn't the best at? That's (laughs) that's, I have not found it. it. Yeah. I also love a uh, Robert Falcon Scott question. We don't run into those that much, but it always feels like. He's in, he's in there. He's always bubbling underneath. Or a chance to see new kids on the block sing right stuff. Yeah, and you know, um, I know that Ken is a huge new kids on the block fan. So it was very, <laughs> I'm sure he was giggling inside when he, when he got to uh, present that clip. Only on the inside. Yeah, well, that was a great week of shows. We got some amazing, iconic Amy Schneider moments. And we got to re-meet Sam Buttry, who we'll be seeing in the Tournament of Champions. As well as take a look at our second chancers, Pam Schoenberg and Doe Park. So, what a week. Now, we would not be bringing you Inside Jeopardy without speaking to those responsible for the game show material. Billy and Michelle are co-head writers. They lead the extraordinary team that is responsible for writing, researching, and vetting Jeopardy clues. And we're so excited to be speaking with them today. Billy and Michelle, thank you both for joining us on Inside Jeopardy. Thank you, Sarah. Very exciting to be here. Welcome. Thanks, Buzzy. You guys, I'm starstruck. I was before you guys came in. I was saying you're real, the real Jeopardy royalty to me. How does that feel? Uh, I can't disagree. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
More importantly, I think Buzzy put a little uh, fashion challenge here, right? Well, I'm I'm trying to slowly up the game of the podcast in terms of <laughs> dress code, and we're working towards Edwardian formal. I think Michelle is on point. Yes. I did my best. Buzzy threw out the challenge. I didn't have time to shop. I just had to shop my closet. I did what I could. Should we discuss it? I love the floral skirt, pleated. Really nice. Thank you. Most important fact, skirt has pockets. Oh, goodness. That uh, the, the skirt with pockets is also a throwback to former contestant Jennifer Morrow's viral tweet, which was uh, someone looking at the night sky. Wow, the universe is so beautiful. God putting his hand into black holes. Thanks. It has pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a fashion throwback I wasn't expecting, Buzzy. We can cut that out. Um, <laughs> do you want to talk to Billy about his fashion? Yeah, Billy, what do you got? What are you wearing today? Uh, I am wearing pants. Yeah. And <laughs> I have a shirt which is, uh, I'm going to do this from memory, it is possibly purple, possibly red, <laughs> and possibly blue. It's some kind of politically oriented uh, mm. statement. Yeah, very bold. And I think we're going to get a lot of letters to the podcast about those choices. Pants and a shirt. I wow. don't know. We're it's really like going We're really going out on a ledge somebody's today. Somebody's planning on dining of, in a restaurant. It's in part of my note. own style. All it right. Well, this is all very exciting. But <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that it's a question I've been asked, I think, my entire time at Jeopardy. Over the last 21 years, people always say, how do you become a writer on Jeopardy? So, Michelle, tell us your story. It involves a lot of luck. I started as a researcher almost 28 years ago, and I answered a classified ad to be a researcher on the show, and a couple of years down the line, an opening for a writer came up, and I submitted a sample game, and I was lucky enough to be chosen to be a writer, first for Jep, the kid's version of Jeopardy, and then transitioned into writing for the big show, as we say. And that's often the path, right? Researcher to writer. It's it's kind of the, the Jeopardy track, if you will. There is no better training ground for being a writer on Jeopardy than starting as a researcher. Yeah, those, those of us who have been on the show a long time, I think some of the patterns and idiosyncrasies and requirements of generating Jeopardy clues are so natural to us that we don't realize how idiosyncratic some of them are. But I think it uh, at this point... It's been a long time since we had a writer start who hadn't been a researcher first, and I think it would be tough for that person to get up to speed without having been immersed in the researcher job first. And how did you snag your Jeopardy gig? A uh, similar story to Michelle's. I was uh, can remember the day, actually, uh, looking through copies of Variety and the shout-out to the Francis Howard Goldwyn Library and Branch Library in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they had a, a blind ad, uh, researcher wanted for a game show, and... Uh, I answered, I answered the ad, I got a, uh, I passed the contestant test, and uh, I wrote some sample questions, even though it was for a researcher job. And then I was very fortunate because the head writer at the time had a very elevated view of McGill University, which is my alma mater, even though it's a great school, apparently he was going around saying, we've got a McGill man. <laughs> which you don't hear all that often, but uh, they hired this me as a researcher. This might be my first time hearing that, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in this country, anyway. And they, they hired me as a researcher, and yes, uh, several years later, I became a writer. Had either of you worked on a television program or a, a game show before you became researchers on Jeopardy? I had certainly not worked as a in television production at all, and... Uh, the first few years at Jeopardy, our library situation was very separate from any kind of production world, and now the two are a little more integrated, and people who work uh, with us are a little more naturally aware of what's going on in production and promotion and other areas. But back then, we were uh, we were very isolated, and it really could have been any job. Uh, <laughs> production aside, you mentioned the Jeopardy library. I think people always want to know. What does it look like? What is in the Jeopardy library? Tell us about kind of your office area and where you guys do what you do. It actually is a library. It is full of books, magazines. Uh, we have we still have some CDs. We do have DVDs. We have thousands of books in there in addition to online resources. And we each have our own office. And pre-COVID, we would wander in and out of each other's offices because you knew that Billy had a copy of Lolita. I know that Debbie has every book that I want to use. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we've got a, we all have bookshelves in our own offices with our own personal collections. The, the books are, I would say, now more useful to the writers because if you're 
writing a category on a given subject, you might want to browse and try and pick out a fact, which is still a lot, for me anyway, a lot more fun and easy to do in a book than skimming through a website and having seven windows open on your desktop. For the researchers, I think, unless they are tracking down a source that one of us has used, they generally tend to go to the internet to find exactly what they are looking for. Yeah, I mean, we used to, Billy was very good at this, have to flip through a novel to find the quote you were looking for if you didn't have it, if you had it from Bartlett's first and you wanted to find it from the novel, you just had to flip through and find it. Now you can search online and it's it's so much easier. What else has changed, would you say? I mean, you've obviously been with the show for nearly three decades for you, Michelle, over that for you, Billy, what how is it, how have you seen it evolve? When I started, the writers were still using typewriters and <laughs> index cards, which was unfathomable to my father. And we did get a computerized database while I started a couple of years in, and that's made a huge difference. Yes, yeah, certainly opened up the things you can ask about. Just you know, it it's made it easier to fill out uh, somewhat narrow categories. You don't have to walk around the library going, can anyone think of a <laughs> writer whose name starts with O apostrophe? You know, you, you, can, you, can find those, you can find lists of those things easier. Uh, so yeah, process wise, I, I mean, I think for both of us, when we started to imagine that there would be something called the internet where you could just type in, you know, who was US Grant's vice president or whatever, and it would come right up, would have been just a dream. I remember reading somewhere that there was a shift when the categories became screens as well. So you didn't have to make it science or history because you were reusing the printed placards. And then you could make it more playful and each week kind of come up with new and exciting categories. Do you come up with, oh, that's a fun category idea and then fill it with clues? Or is it generated from a clue that you like, and then you kind of figure out the category afterwards. This it's, might be a personal question. It's both. It depends on what happens. You may think of a great title and then think, and for me, it's going into John Duarte's office and saying, hey, I thought of this title. What should it be? And then sometimes you come up with a great fact and you're like, well, I'm just going to write a movies category around it. We definitely, if you look at the show from the 80s and early 90s, it was definitely had very sort of stodgy down the down the middle of the plate category titles, American history, science, and so forth. And uh, when Harry Friedman became the executive producer and Gary Johnson became the head writer, we were encouraged to do more playful categories that uh, under the previous regime wouldn't have been allowed. I remember trying to pitch a, a former producer a category on sleep, and he just said, that's, that's too narrow. I said, it's a third of your life. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but he just felt it was it was too outside the box. Speaking of the categories, from when it's conceptualized to when we see it on a game board, what does that process look like? Uh, well, the writer sits down, whether it came out of a clue or came out of the category first, sits down and writes the category, all the clues, all the sources, uh, one source at least for each fact, uh, gives uh, puts seven clues in, Michelle or I, as the head writers, look over the category, put it in order, throw out the clue we like least, or keep them all if they're if they're all good, uh, and then it uh, code it singular double jeopardy, and then it goes to the researcher, and the researcher uh, goes over it, makes sure every fact in it is double sourced, and makes sure the clue is pinned, which is. Jeopardies or game showies for there's only one correct response, or you're prepared for the other ones if they should be said. Uh, and then the category is ready to put into a game. When you guys put the games together, I know I was really interested to learn about kind of the, the color coding and kind of how they go together. Can you speak about that? Is that too inside Jeopardy? There, we're on inside Jeopardy, so there's no <laughs> too inside Jeopardy. Is there's my no opinion. such thing. I don't think it's a secret, but we. <laughs> We color code our categories, so pink is pop culture, yellow is wordplay, blue is academic stuff like geography, history, literature, green is kind of more lifestyle stuff like potpourri, food and drink, newspapers and magazines, and- Fashion. Yes, fashion. And- They're we, all looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we try to make each game 
as easy or as difficult as the one before it and the one after it. It's got to be steady. Michelle, do you have favorite categories to write or anything that stands out? I do like writing fashion. I'm with Buzzy on that. <laughs> I love literature. I love science. Geography, not my favorite. They can't all be. How about they for you, Billy? <laughs> uh, I, I kind of like thinking, uh, Michelle writes geography very well, and I think that one one reason is that sometimes it's easier to write about things that you know little about. Uh, I also know a fair amount about literature, but if I'm writing physics, then I can uh, pretty much be sure that if I've heard of it, then everyone has heard of it, and that makes it a little bit easier to write accessible materials. Is there a writer who runs point on the, quote, dreaded opera category, unquote? Not at this point. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> it's become too dreaded. Too dreaded. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I enjoy writing opera, even though I've only gone to one or two operas in my life. I also enjoy art history. Yeah, Kathy Easterling, uh, a former writer on the show, was uh, an opera buff and... She would write opera fairly often, and other people would just only write it occasionally, but now it's kind of a, an opera free-for-all. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of a free-for-all, if there's a category that you come up with, but you know, oh, this is a subject that another writer knows a lot about, do you bring them into that, or do you consult with them, or do you kind of write it in a little bit of your own bubble and then present it to to the team? Well, as Michelle and I, as, as head writers, part of our job is to think of more things than we can actually write. So we definitely assign things to people that we think are, are extra qualified to write them. I love the process of when I'll come to you guys with a celebrity we're planning to do a category with and I won't really have a direction. And all of a sudden I get back this brilliant category that is so well thought of in a way that I don't think people would even think to go there. It's such a skill that you that you and all the writers possess. Do you does that just come naturally? Where do you get that creative edge? <laughs> uh. <laughs> They're speechless. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just the way our brains work, I guess. I don't know. We all kind of love wordplay and writing and thinking. Yeah, some, uh, you just take a little extra time and try and think of, is there something that's not obvious but that really fits with this person? You mentioned that you love wordplay and games. Are there certain games or puzzles or wordplay or things that each of you really enjoy in your free time when you're not creating America's Favorite Quiz Show? I'm a big fan of the New York Times crossword puzzle, and I do the spelling bee in the magazine. I don't play Wordle. I don't do online games because I spend all day on a computer, so mm. I'm a paper and pen person. Uh, I, I play with, with my kids and my wife sometimes just anagram games on the computer, and sometimes I will annoy them by just randomly seeing a word and and saying, you know, bagel, gale, bag, lee, ale. And <laughs> I can't well, imagine why that would have oh, been. That I sounds like so much fun that. for a dinner I mean, yeah. table yeah. conversation. They, you would think that everyone would just join in, but that's not what happened. The, the, the Wise Family road trips got cut off at some point, and nobody knows why. <laughs> Speaking about regular material, and then obviously we've been talking a lot about our upcoming Second Chance and Tournament of Champions, I don't know if everyone at home knows just what an extra level of the process that puts in for you guys having to write for contestants who have already played on the show. Yeah, I mean, the contestants in this year's Tournament of Champions in particular have played hundreds of games among them, and the universe of Jeopardy clues that people can respond to correctly is not that huge, so... It's it's an effort to either phrase things a new way that's not related to the way they had it before or find something completely different to to ask about. So no contestant has an advantage because they already had a clue about Mary Shelley or whoever it is. So obviously you have a lot of pre-production that goes into every tape day, but then you're very much a part of the judges table on the actual production day, as well as a number of other things that happen on a tape day. Can you kind of talk us through a typical tape day for you and your team? Well, we start off with the six games that are possible uh, games for that day. And then the person from the outside company, Sullivan Compliance, calls us and tells us which five we're going to do and in what order. Um, then there is a tape day meeting, which involves the host and a few other people. 
and we make any last minute changes if uh, the five games turn out to have similar clues within them that are that are too similar either because because they'll advantage the contestant or because people are just going to get sick of hearing about Benjamin Franklin then we uh, we change those sometimes the the hosts are coming to the that material uh, you know kind of late in the process so they have things that they want to phrase a different way and or they might need help with pronunciation Yes, there are some doozies of Why pronunciation. Why is everyone staring at me? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, then the games are, are in hopefully final final form and uh, off they go to the production realm. Yeah, and one change that has happened in the last couple of years, you know, Alex used to work off of a big script and mark off each of the clues with his Crayola because we realized that didn't make much noise. And now everything is electronic. So the clues are actually, you know, brought up one by one for our host. And those all have to be scanned after you guys do your completion. So there's a whole added level to that process. Yeah, that was uh, that, that worked out well because uh, it was decided that uh, that we would try and do it that way since we were going to have guest hosts and it was a long process for uh, Vista Electronics who does all that work for us and uh, and they they finally got it right and then uh, on one particular day we had a well I won't say which guest host but this we this won't guest say. <laughs> this this guest host uh, was struggling a little with jumping around the the script and figuring out what had been asked and what hadn't been asked, which is hard. Alex made it look easy, but he it's sure it's did. not easy when there are 30 clues on a board. And so we decided, well, let's just try it. So we brought this thing out and uh, and uh, the people at Vista said, well, it worked out great for us because uh, this guest host thinks that we created that in five minutes instead of six months. <laughs> <laughs> We'll go with it. We'll yeah. give Vista credit for that. No problem. Okay, so the games are ready. It's time to shoot our five shows. What does that look like for you guys? Uh, well, we go to the stage. Uh, Michelle and I have uh, are at the production table. Which the judges' table, the judges, as people judges have table. known it for years. Yes, yes the judges' table. Uh, we have particular jobs. Michelle uh, keeps up with the scores, makes sure that the electronic scoring is done correctly which is a kind of an intimidating job. I wouldn't want to do it. And, I would not and, either. And the people who have subbed in for her have not wanted to no, do it. No, they haven't wanted to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say about that, it's just math. It's just addition and subtraction. <laughs> no? It, no? It, and it you is. prepare the final Jeopardy card. I do. So, yes, you've revealed my secret uh, job of backup scorekeeper. I am making sure that uh, my fine friends at Vista Electronics are doing the scores correctly on the podium. Sometimes they hit it twice or they don't give the scores, or there's a technical problem, so I can stop tape if the scores are wrong. And I do have the host's final card, and it's a tremendous responsibility to make sure that I get all the numbers right. I'm, I can see what the wagers are for final. I do both versions if they get it right, if they get it wrong, and then what the continuing money would be for the returning champion. And as we discovered with guest host, because Alex just took it in stride, it is a sea of numbers, and it doesn't make sense when you first look at it if you haven't been doing it for 30 or 40 years. Yes, because so many scenarios are on one card. <laughs> yes, yes, which Buzzy knows. And then if there's a two-day total point affair final, yes. oh boy, <laughs> then it's an extra sea of numbers when that's you right. carry those numbers over for everybody. And that's what I like to call the Uber card where I've actually done a little arts and crafts to make it big enough for all of that math. Excellent penmanship you have, I must point out, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Billy and I are actually watching. We see in real time what the contestants are writing in final. So we can see the penmanship, the challenges, what the letters are, and if they haven't finished. Like in the unfortunate case recently of Harriet Tubman, we could see that she ran out of time and that she did not get the N in Tubman. And it was heartbreaking, but she didn't finish. Yes. And, and as you know, as we often have to remind people who feel sorry for a given contestant any any decision you make in favor of one contestant is hurting the other two so just all you always have to keep that in mind in any judging situation i will say now being a, a newer member of the the judging panel oftentimes when we do stop to discuss i mean we take a lot of time and effort to make sure we're making the most fair decision and i would say we often are all on the same page would you agree yeah i would say so yeah and i think you know sometimes someone will have a a different viewpoint on it and I think people 
can be convinced otherwise. But I think most of the time, yeah, the first our first reaction is all pretty much in unison. I love, too, that, you know, you're on the phone with John Duarte, who's talking to those back in the office. Like, there are multiple people looking in to any time we stop down, not just those of us at the judging table. In terms of an acceptable response we may not have anticipated, like, there's a whole team that is really making sure we get to the bottom of this. Yeah, any research stop, the entire library is all the writers and researchers are in the library monitoring and all hands on deck when need be. They'll make phone calls, they'll hit the books, they'll hit the internet to find out what we, what needs to be found out. Yeah, I think I think that may be a COVID change also. I'm, I'm, since I'm not there, I don't know exactly, but I know it used to be kind of a raucous affair with everyone <laughs> sitting around <laughs> Sitting around Rock the conference table, the tape day. Watching, <laughs> watching the game, and and then, when necessary, leaping to the books on the internet. Now, now it might happen uh, individually in their offices in kind of a more bloodless way. Well, we know how difficult it is for any of our contestants to actually be, you know, one of the few hundred that get on the show each season. I often say, you know, it's all about the categories. It depends if your categories come up that day. What would be like a dream day? For either of you, if you were a Jeopardy contestant in, in a world of categories, uh, RuPaul, art history, crossword clues, books and authors. All right, we, we've got your lane. How about okay. you, Billy? Uh, literature, sports of the last century, history, maybe a little geography. And uh, I'll take a few surprises, too. <laughs> well, potpourri for Billy. I like it. Right. Recently, we had regular Virginia on as a category, kind of a little ode to Margaret Shelton and her response earlier in the season. How does something like that come about? How do you guys make those decisions on the, the callbacks you're going to do of sorts? When something gets the public's attention, then, you know, it's it's always fun to play with it on the show. And you don't want to be chasing viral moments in kind of a pathetic way. <laughs> but, uh, but when something... Well, right but, here, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that one that one seemed obvious and, and it was just a, a natural as a category too. It didn't have to be forced into a, a, a way to make it a category. It just was a category, West Virginia and regular Virginia. So that was that was an easy decision. Which makes me want to ask, do you, each of you have a favorite clue or category in your long tenure that you always think of as like, yeah, that was the one. Nailed it. Yeah. I have a favorite. Let's hear it. I don't remember the category. It might have been food and drink. It was a final. What was so great is I was, I got it for me, the, the label, and it was like in 1929, Charles Eady, and maybe his, this isn't the exact wording, came up with this flavor to reflect the times ahead and it was Rocky Road ice cream. Ah. That's very good. Billy? Billy? Uh, uh, it's actually, it never appeared on a show, on the show, <laughs> although I did, I did manage to. Wow, what a winner, Billy. I yeah. managed to get it into the interview. I just Sometimes you just see something, you're like, that is a, a, a clue. And, uh, and now I think all this, the names have maybe aged out of people's consciousness, but I... I saw an interview once where Gene Siskel said, people keep giving me lighted pens and I never use them and I'm sick of getting them. And I just thought, what a great, great little bit of deduction. What would you give a movie critic? You would give him a little lighted pen so that he could write notes in the dark. And it just, I just never managed to get it onto the show and now no one remembers Gene Siskel. And I guess that was not as charming a story as you had hoped. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've revealed it here on Inside Jeopardy, so yes. now we can't use it in a game. But, yes. you know, it will live on through this podcast, I think. With the debut of season 39 right around the corner, Michelle, what are you looking most forward to? Oh, that's a good question. I'm excited to see the TFC. I think it's going to be some exciting games. And, you know, I got to do some hand stretches to keep up with the scoring because they are going to play fast. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I think I think we're all looking forward to this, the TFC and... Uh, we're looking forward to the second chance. It's it's kind of a, an interesting concept. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, undersell it, but it's interesting that their cumulative total of games won is zero. So it'll be really interesting to see whether they actually have more than that would indicate as contestants. Uh, we've we've written those games, I think, pretty straightforwardly. They're not any at any different level and. We'll just see how they do. 
Well, we like to think if they have to win their first game to make it into the two-day final and then have a solid two-day final, it's almost like they're a three-day champion. So <laughs> I think it lines them up nicely with coming in yes, behind the, our four-day champions. Yeah, the ones that get into the TFC will definitely have uh, gone their, undergone their trial by fire. Yeah, I, I mentioned this, I think, in when I was guest hosting, but Jeopardy is a unique beast in that however you come in, no matter how cool or smart, eventually you get sent home a loser. So you are like a loser factory, basically. Two-thirds of every person who appears on Jeopardy every day is a loser. And yet you lose with pride. Lose with so much Jeopardy pride. you're a Jeopardy contestant. Yeah. I mean, you can say that at yeah. a cocktail party for the rest of your life. I was on Jeopardy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Ken Jennings in particular has been... Uh, pumping the contestants up by telling them that. But he says, you made it here. That, that's an yeah. achievement. Yeah, that's the achievement. Now just enjoy it. Have fun. Let go of outcomes. Yeah, he's able to talk to the contestants now and also to an audience. We finally welcomed an audience back. I know you both remember how much Alex loved an audience and taking questions. Um, you both spent lots of time in that writer's room with Alex, and I wondered if either of you had a story you wanted to share or a memory or... Uh, you know, he was a fascinating man, and uh, I'm envious of the time that people like you, Sarah, who got to travel with him, uh, spent that uh, we, we did not so often. Um, i trying to think of one particular story it's it's hard to come up with it's more it's more an attitude he was just very passionate about the show and uh and and you know had a sense of humor about it but uh it was just so important to him that we we put out a good product and uh that that certainly stays with everybody alex also liked to do the crossword puzzle and sometimes he would call me or come by my office before the tape day meeting and ask for a little bit of help on the puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't have always have done it yet, so I'd have to get it going so that I could join him. But there was one particular clue that he said, I don't understand what this means. What's Benicito? <laughs> and it was be nice to. That's great. Yeah. He loved to come up with a few categories. Um, a couple come to mind when he wanted to do his football science. Do you remember the drawings that he created? Yes, he he, he drew the uh, the referees signals for us. Uh, he would come up with some categories. He was a passionate old movie fan, and he would sometimes he he came in with a uh, a fact that he thought would be a great tournament of champions final. It was it had to do with Academy Award nominations of the 1930s. And the response was, who is Jane Darwell? And <laughs> we, we usually just went ahead and ran with his ideas, but we had to gently tell him that we, we did not think that in 2010 or whenever it was that Jane Darwell was going to be on our contestants' lips or at the end of their <laughs> pens. He did also come up with a logos category, a fashion logos category, and he drew the logos for Gucci and Chanel, and <laughs> we couldn't actually clear them, but we still have the little drawings that he made it was they were very good you also got to see alex not as buzzy always is dressed in his fashion best because we know how alex would come into your writers meetings right this is true and actually before i worked on the show i was a big fan of the show and i still have somewhere in my house a post-it that my mom left me that she had seen alex at arts deli in studio city and said he was not his usual dapper <laughs> self and you know i didn't know at that point alex would show up wearing a pair of jeans and a t-shirt that someone had given him and you know you were lucky if there weren't stains or rips in the t-shirt because yeah. he w wore it to do work around the house and I will just add I have seen Buzzy in jeans and like a hoodie when I came to your house one time That's you were right. not in a suit and I was shocked yeah Yes, it is shocking though. It's like seeing, you know, like when you see a dog that's been shaved for surgery. For surgery. <laughs> I would not have put it that way. <laughs> All right. Well, we have one of our favorite parts of the show, and that is answering our questions. And we submitted them knowing that you, Billy, and Michelle would be here today. So, our first question Christopher asks Since the categories are randomized from show to show, is there a select grouping that has to appear in the shows? Like, to history, one movie, to wordplay. We kind of answered that, but what would you say to Christopher? Yeah, I would say that he, Christopher is right on, except there, there is a history and, and a geography and a literature in every game. And, uh, and beyond that, it's not so much categories as the kind of broader segments of knowledge that Michelle was talking about before. And just to his point, it's not the categories that are randomized. The game exists as a game. The games are randomized in the pick. So the game is stable and what's in it. Mm -hmm. Christopher has a follow-up question. 
Say I was able to make it on the show, what advice would you give new contestants and what would you tell them to study in order to prepare? I would say first I would tell them to study because <laughs> uh, sometimes contestants come on. I mean, I, some, I know sometimes they may not have had time, but I, I, I feel like how many chances are you going to get in your life to win $30,000 in half an hour? You might want to to uh, focus on it a little bit. Uh, I would say uh, who was president in what year and what are the capitals of the world's countries would be a very good place to start. And study what you don't know. Ken famously didn't know booze and made sure that flashcards flash of booze were done. Also, wagering is going to come up. You may not get a daily double, but you are probably playing final. Watch a video. See yep. what you maybe should do. There's plenty out there. There's a ton of them out there. there. Are, yep, there are a lot of people giving good advice on wagering. Good advice on studying is out there as well. Um, we have almost 40 years of Jeopardy material to look back on. Not that you repeat, but there's areas of information that are, let's say, in the Jeopardy wheelhouse. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Hunter asks, as someone who writes and hosts his own family Jeopardy games for his mom, father, and sisters... I have to know, what makes the perfect Jeopardy clue? Something that makes a player or a viewer go, I didn't know that? Yeah, that's the classic uh, response you want. Well, there are three classic responses. I knew that. I should have known that. I didn't know that, but I, now I'm glad I do. I lean towards things that you can figure out, like the lighted pen uh, <laughs> example. <laughs> I think those are those are fun when it's the contestant might look at a clue to start with and think, how is anyone supposed to know that? But then maybe a second or two later, they realize that there's a back door to it. Those are not that easy to come up with, but to me, those are the, the most enjoyable clues. And those make great daily doubles, the clue within the clue, two-step process to figure it out. That's great for a daily double or a final. Makes for a great game. I definitely love when you don't know a clue at face value as you're talking about Billy, but you can get there. There, there is something uniquely satisfying about about that feeling, and that's really, I think, what the writing that you two and your team do. Why it feels so good to watch at home because when you figure it out, something that you maybe didn't know off the top of your head, oof, can't beat that. Can't beat that. Can't beat this interview in terms of satisfying. I feel satisfied. That is it for today's episode of Inside Jeopardy. Thank you again to Buzzy, Billy, and Michelle for joining me. As always, it is a pleasure to spend time with the three of you. Looking ahead to next week, we will be featuring the first exclusive interview with our Jeopardy hosts, Mayim Bialik and Ken Jennings. You won't want to miss it. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And as always, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social, and follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and on YouTube. And send your questions in to InsideJeopardyPodcast at gmail.com. See you next week. Thanks to our guests. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Buzzy. And thank you, Billy. Looking for more fun Jeopardy videos? The smart thing to do would be to click the subscribe button below. 